Hello, and welcome to the Psychology Podcast. Today's episode is part of the Best Of series, where we highlight some of the most exciting and enthralling and enlightening episodes from the archives of the Psychology Podcast. Enjoy. Welcome to the Psychology Podcast, where we give you insights into the mind, brain, behavior, and creativity. I'm Dr. Scott Barry Kaufman, and in each episode, I have a conversation with a guest who will stimulate your mind and give you a greater understanding of yourself, others, and the world we live in. Hopefully, we'll also provide a glimpse into human possibility. Thanks for listening, and enjoy the podcast. Today, it's great to have Noam Chomsky on the podcast. Noam is a public intellectual, linguist, and political activist. He's the author of many influential books, including Manufacturing Consent, The Political Economy of the Mass Media, and his latest with Robert Pollan, Climate Crisis and the Green New Deal, The Political Economy of Saving the Planet. Chomsky is also known for helping initiate and sustain the cognitive revolution. He is laureate professor of linguistics at the University of Arizona and institute professor emeritus at MIT. Thanks so much for making time to chat with me today, Noam. Glad to be with you. Just had to take care of a dog. <laughs> <laughs> Is the dog okay? Yeah, I'm just trying to horn in. I'm trying to shut him up down this down. It's okay if if if, uh, if he or she wants to participate in the podcast. That's fine with me. <laughs> usually, she usually calms down and gets under the desk. <laughs> huh? <laughs> Excellent. Well, so I'm a cognitive scientist by training, so. I, I'm, and I'm, one of the things I'm really fascinated with is the, is the history of, of the field that I work in. And um, I had the great pleasure of working with and being mentored by Herb Simon, for instance, who uh, was one of the ones who helped uh, form this cognitive revolution as well. And, and I was wondering if you could, we could trace a little bit, um, you know, in the 60s, 50s, how did your work, um, you know, in linguistics intersect with the other work going on during that cognitive revolution at the time, the work on decision making? And uh, and Marvin Minsky's work. How did all this stuff coalesce? Did that that epic. Can you take me back to the '50s, '60s, right now? Well, uh, I knew Herb Simon and Marv Minsky. Marv, most of my life we were colleagues. So the uh, it was one of the strains that one of the core elements of the what's called the cognitive revolution. I don't like the term particularly. But one of the core elements, of course, was language. Uh, the other core element was vision, a couple of other things. And uh, so we, we all knew each other. Uh, my own work was on uh, trying to construct uh, a theoretical accounts of, that would account for the capacity of humans to do what we're now doing. It's a core problem of the cognitive sciences. What's the nature of the capacity? How can an individual acquire it during their lifetimes, in fact, during their early childhood? And uh, ultimately, how could such a system evolve? Those are the core problems of the uh, study of linguistics beginning around 1950. That's a pretty sharp break from uh, structural linguistics, which had quite different goals and aspirations. I've actually uh, written some about these years, if you if you want me to send you something. That'd be great. Yeah, I'll just, I have your email, so I'll send it to you. That'd be really great. Yeah, so when did you first make contact with behaviorism, and what was your, like, immediate gut reaction when you first encountered that that body of work and, and, and the notions of uh, sort of the stimulus response? way of thinking well, about behavior. Sort of knew about it from childhood, but the real encounter was when I moved to Cambridge. I came to Harvard as a grad student in 1951. Uh, that I was basically studying philosophy, so I was a student of Van Quine's mainly, and he was one of the chief uh, exponents of Skinnerian uh, operant conditioning of this you know, rigid form of behaviorism. And Skinner's uh, William James lectures had just appeared a couple of years ago. Mm. So later became the, uh, his uh, book on language. But 
uh, and the drafts were very widely read and it was influential in part because of Quine's advocacy in part because it, it fit the tenor of the times very well. So it was kind of a Bible when I got there. Uh, you look at, say, George Miller's uh, mm. first early books, not the later ones. They were pretty strict behaviors. Uh, there was even, you know, some of his early experiments were considered rather shocking. It sounds kind of obvious. <laughs> yeah. Showing that uh, you could understand a word better if it was in a sentence than if it was in, if it was in isolation, which shouldn't happen on... Uh, what should happen on rigid behaviorist grounds is that you hear the first word of a sentence, then there's a certain probability for the next one, and kind of like what's done with deep learning today. And by the time you got to the end of the sentence, you can barely guess what the word is because the probabilities go down. But of course, the results are exactly the opposite. As you hear the sentence, you can guess the last word. You, none of this works. But that was some of his early work, and it was considered quite Rising. By the mid 50s, George had significantly changed and became one of the founders of cognitive science. But yeah. when I got there in 51, this was orthodoxy. Yeah. Uh, along with uh, a couple other things that happened, uh, uh, Claude Shannon had come along with information theory. The Shannon and Weaver book, with Weaver's kind of popularization and extension of the technical ideas was another Bible. Cybernetics was another. Uh, signal detection, radio engineering was another. And they all kind of converged into a euphoria of which Skinnerian behaviorism was a central part, a sense that we're cracking the last frontier. Mm. When Crick and Watson came along in 53, that sort of enhanced the idea that we're now moving to a new era, it was called unified science, in which we'd be able to, we had the tools to uh, deal with the problems that were uh, called problems of mind and psychology. Uh, there were a couple of us who thought this was all nonsense. Uh, three, in fact, uh, two, three grad students, my friend, Morris Halley, who I worked with till the end of his life, and uh, Eric Lennerberg, who also a grad student. Uh, he went on in later years to found uh, the modern biology of language. But the three of us just didn't believe any of it. We uh, thought it made no sense. Uh, we began re reading uh, European comparative ecology, Tinberg and Lawrence, uh, Others uh, uh, looked at comparative psychology work, and uh, I, I, I was introduced by a friend, Mar Shapiro, an art historian, suggested I should read uh, Carl Lashley's Serial Order and Behavior, which was a very important article back in around 1950, mm -hmm. which just knocked the the props out of the whole behavior system. Nobody knew it. I mean, neurologists knew it. It was in the neuroscience literature, but uh, psychologists and linguists and others were totally unaware of it. When I, I wrote about it for the first time in a review of Skinner's Verbal Behavior, went to press in 1957, uh, but that, I think, was the first mention of it in the general psychology, cognitive science, literature. Uh, so well, that these were things that we, we were, uh, Eric went on to start writing articles on, he was doing a good deal of work at the time on uh, uh, various uh, aberrant forms of linguistic behavior, mm -hmm. studying uh, pathologies, uh, uh, early studies on use of sign, uh, uh, cognitive deficiencies in language and neural deficiencies. And this went on to become his biology of language book, very, very important book, Biological Foundations of Language. But at first it was essentially the three of us, then 
George Miller got interested and uh, linked up with Jerry Bruner, who was yeah. he and George formed the uh, cognitive science group at Harvard. Spent a year there. I was working and quite a lot with George Miller in the mid fifties. Published a couple of articles together, taught together, and so on. And it then it just kind of expanded, it linked up to some extent with the early work in artificial intelligence. Uh, Herb Simon, uh, Simon and Newell, um, mm-hmm. Paul Minsky and McCarthy, and by, by the early 60s, it had become kind of a fairly, I can't say integrated, because there were a lot of internal disputes, but uh, interlinked uh, approach to many questions. The euphoria by then had pretty much dissipated. You get a you can get a good sense of it by uh, reading Yehoshua Bar Hillel's uh, essays around 1965. He's an Israeli logician who was a regular visitor to Harley Research Lab of Electronics at MIT, which was kind of the center of most of it. And uh, at first, he was very much a partisan of the euphoric hopes, but. Uh, by the mid '60s, he, he he was a close personal friend, also back from about 1950. But uh, he had pretty much come around to agreeing with the skeptical approach, and wrote some retrospectives about it, which are quite interesting and, and knowledgeable. Around the mid '60s, uh, you can get a sense from his work. Uh, that's kind of what it was like in the early days. In Cambridge, uh, there was no linguistics. Mm-hmm. I was practically the only linguist. The Roman Jakobson was there, but from the European tradition, but there were no American linguists. So I, 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 I was, in fact, about the only person. There was an American linguistics tradition, in fact, a consensus, uh, but it was uh, quite different in character. It was, it was described, its, its proponents described it as a taxonomic science, a set of procedures which you could apply to any corpus of data. It would identify the elements and their distributional arrangement. That was linguistics. It's basically my own background. But this was quite different. So, what was it like? You know, did, was there a great excitement in the air? Did you feel like you were you were leading a revolution at the time, or was it only in retrospect that you realized it was a revolution? Well, myself, I thought it was just a personal hobby. Mm. I took for granted that the consensus uh, of American linguists was had to be on the right track, and this was a totally different approach. But it was my own. Then, a couple of others got interested in it. By, by the mid-50s, we felt that we were pursuing something that should displace the uh, linguistic consensus. And as I say, none of us agreed with the, uh, none of us means three of three of us, yeah, yeah. with the uh, behaviorist uh, dogmas that were rampant at the time. But uh, there were, you know, the question wasn't, is it a revolution, but is this the right way to pursue things? Yeah. Gradually, I learned that there were antecedents. As I say, we were reading a European ethology, which had some similarities. Uh, and uh, I began looking into the history a little further, learned that there was a much earlier tradition that had been totally forgotten. Uh, and some of that. So my own view in retrospect that this, you might call this the second cognitive revolution, turns out in the 17th century, the time of the origin of modern science, a lot of things of this kind were happening. They didn't have, they, what they lacked and what we had was the theory of computation. It didn't come along till mid 20th century. So there were no tools for trying to explore the kinds of questions that they were raising. Yeah. But if you look back to 
Galileo and his contemporaries, they they recognized something very significant. It wasn't discovered later until I wrote about it in the mid sixties. And almost nobody knows it now either. But in fact, if you look back, the, uh, the, the early founders of modern science, like Galileo, uh, were just amazed by what they regarded as the most astonishing, remarkable fact in the world, mm. that with a few dozen symbols, we could construct in our minds infinitely many thoughts and even convey to others who have no access to our minds the innermost workings of our minds. Mm. They, the Galileo, for example, thought that the, the alphabet was the most stupendous of human inventions because it enabled this miracle to take place. And of course, it was understood that the alphabet was just representing some system in the mind which does the same thing. And that did develop a tradition of what was called general and rational grammar through the 18th, 17th, 18th centuries, which tried to develop these ideas, but lacking the theory of computation, there was no way to formulate it. Sure. How do you formulate a computational process that captures these capacities? By the mid 20th century, like when I was a student, I was studying logic and recursive function theory, and you could you could see that that offered that, that modern recursive function theory and theory of computation provided the tools in which you could proceed to develop computational systems, which gave a recursive enumeration of the expressions of a language, basically expressions of thought. And you could find, and also provided means by which this could be translated into the, mapped into sensory motor outputs and inputs. So you could link it to perception, uh, production, uh, learnability, how could it be acquired, all these questions came on the agenda as soon as this fell together. Yeah, I'd love to double click there for a second on this idea of innateness and this idea of learnability. Um, what was unique about what you did was it was certainly not saying that learning doesn't matter at all in the process, but the learning of the language seemed to operate in a way that almost the language of the word learning doesn't seem to to really conform to what uh, psychologists had tend to think of as as learning during that time. It didn't seem to operate by those same sort of principles. I was wondering how your thoughts on this have evolved over the years, especially in light of um, Arthur Reber's work, for instance, on implicit learning. Um, showing that uh, artificial grammars can be learned, that uh, we are not uh, sort of hardwired. I, I'm not a big fan of that phrase, but you know what I mean, hardwired to have uh, that specific uh, rule structure. But we perhaps maybe like through t statistical learning, we can um, learn languages. And that, so there's a lot less built in than maybe we once thought. And I'm wondering how you, what, what your current thinking of that is. Uh, all of these results are negative. They show you can't do anything. Mm. Uh, if you can do, I mean, if you, if you have a bunch of supercomputers running and uh, uh, huge amounts of data and uh, do a lot of statistical analysis, you can come close to approximating a set of phenomena. Like you can come pretty close to approximating the sentences in the Wall Street Journal. That's of zero scientific interest. If you did a ton of statistical analysis of chemical experiments, let's say, you know, people mixing things in the laboratory and so on, you could get a fair approximation to what they're actually doing. Would that tell you anything about chemistry? Nothing. It's a game. It's a way of selling a propaganda for IBM. You know, or for Google these days, but it, it tells you absolutely nothing about the nature of the system and the way it's acquired and learned. Uh, human beings don't. Uh, a two or three year old child has mastered the basis of the language. We now know 
know from statistical analysis the data available to a child that it's extremely impoverished. I mean, it sounds like the child is hearing millions of sentences, but when you take into account such elementary facts as Zipf's law, you know, you know this the, the rank frequency distribution. Yeah. And it turns out that almost everything you're barely even hearing bigrams, let alone trigrams. Uh, so from the what's back in the this is what's there, there is a problem that was understood in the early fifties called poverty of stimulus. Yeah. How do you go from the impoverished stimuli available to the rich knowledge attained? Uh, it was obvious in the early fifties. This is a major problem. By now we know it's a much worse problem, mm. far worse than was assumed, because it because now, by now we have extensive studies, first of all of the data available, but we don't have to guess anymore, and extensive studies of acquisition of language. None of that existed at the time, and it turns out that at about the earliest age you can start testing, the kids already have very rich knowledge, which goes way beyond what they produce. Now, this is work that's gone on for 50, 60 years. So the problem of poverty of stimulus is overwhelming. Now, the deep learning approaches have no problem. They have basically as much data as you want. Mm. Vast amounts of data, huge amounts of computing capacity. And with that, what they get is kind of what you'd get if you did what I just suggested. I looked, looked at, or take, take say an example closer to language. Suppose that you did a deep learning studies of uh, the uh, communication system of bees. Okay. You could get a fair prediction, probably pretty good predictions, of what bees do. You know, bees start going out of the hive, they wander around, they find a flower, they, uh, they, they have the capacity of dead reckoning, so they go straight back to the hive, they waggle their wings, and the other bees start fluttering around when they go to the flower. Would that tell you anything about bee communication? Nothing, you know? It's not what von Frisch was doing. It's not what other bee scientists do. They want to find out how it works. The fact that you can kind of approximate the phenomena just tells you nothing. You can look at the phenomena without approximating. Well, you know, I'm thinking of these implicit learning paradigms that I administered in my dissertation, like serial reaction time learning or artificial grammar learning. Um, this formed a core basis of my dissertation. I was really interested to the extent to which there's individual differences where people can soak up the probabilistic rule structure of something it, unconsciously, you know, without their um, conscious awareness. And I found that people, um, or some people are better at it than others, but overall, you know, most people, I debriefed them afterwards. I said, did you notice that 15% of the time this sequence, it followed this sequence, 85% of the time it followed that sequence, and that you got faster at uh, the reaction time for the 85%, and they had no idea, you know, consciously that they learned these things. And these were artificial, you know, languages. These were not, uh, you know, uh, uh, something that we evolved. And so do you think that's telling us anything about how much is built in versus how much is not built in? Because I think it might, I think it does tell us something. It tells you something about human cognition, but I think it's a mistake to use the word artificial languages. Hmm. Nothing to do with languages. I mean, these are data sets that have, may, are constructed to share some of the superficial properties of languages. But it tells you absolutely nothing about how language is acquired. Certainly not acquired this way. Hmm. I mean, kids, as I say, if you take a look at the actual data available to children, you don't even get a lot of bigrams, let alone trigrams. Hmm. And uh, this is not there because what, you're, what the kid is hearing mostly is the function words. You know, the and of and so on and then um, 
you look at the rank frequency distribution, it goes very sharply down and tails off into a long tail. Hmm. Uh, so, I mean, there's, there's some statistical learning, but it's very much at the margins. You know, the, the, so it's, there's nothing wrong with the experiments. They're studying, they're interesting things to study about cognition. And of course, everything goes on unconsciously. Like you and I have absolutely no awareness of the rules that we're following in this uh, conversation, mm. way beyond the levels of consciousness. I mean, people are deluded to think that what we call inner speech is somehow our thinking processes. Absolutely not. What we call inner speech is a pale reflection of the externalized form of what's going on in our minds. Uh, and if you actually think about it, it's just bits and pieces of fragments. Our construction of sentences in our minds is vastly more quick than what we call inner speech. And you can see it very simply by just doing things like reading out loud, which is much slower than reading. You can read a page in a fraction of the time and understand it of reading it out loud because the externalization is just very much slowing everything down. There's all kind of stuff going on in our minds. We can study it the way we study B communication from the outside, but can't introspect into it. It's totally beyond the level of consciousness. How do you link some of this to modern day behavioral genetics? What do you think of the field of modern day behavioral genetics? And you know, obviously those tools weren't available to you when you first uh, when you first started in the field, and I was wondering sort of what your your own sort of thinking about about that is in terms of what it tells us about innateness. Well, you know, it tells us. I mean, it's an important field. You can, it's an important field for biology, but it's very far from accounting for even much simpler traits than language. Mm. There was a lot of enthusiasm when the genome project came along about all the things that were going to follow from it. But what we've mainly learned is you haven't a clue how uh, instructions in the DNA turn into an organism. I mean, even just figuring out how you get protein folding, you can barely do. By now, that's an area where AI has made some contributions. But that's remember this is the bare beginning of what makes uh, an organism. It's, it's 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 good to study these things, but you should study simple traits, not a very complex trait like language, which is going to be way out of sight for any such uh, investigations or intelligence. Whatever intelligence is. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think it, intelligence is? Well, all I can tell you is that I, for about 60 years, was on admissions committees for graduate courses at MIT, which has pretty high standards. You can pick maybe 5% of the applicants, and they're all very highly qualified. I can't remember once when anybody ever suggested looking at IQ. Hmm. Nobody cares. It's totally irrelevant. That's not the kind of thing you look. I'm sure you find the same thing. I mean, you're, you've been on commission on admissions commissions. Yeah. For grad school. Did you ever look at IQ? Well, you know, SAT is a proc is a correlated with IQ very very highly, right? So, it, it, subconsciously, if we look at SAT or indirectly, well, or, yeah. or are we selecting for IQ? I don't know about you, but we looked at SAT as a kind of a marginal phenomenon and of some interest. For example, if, if some kid, uh, applicant, is just all A's, you know, top flight in every area in the SAT, we regarded that as kind of negative. Probably means he has no, no special interests and no ingenuity and creativity. If you get somebody who does very well in some areas and very poorly in others, you want to take a second look. Maybe there's some... Maybe there's some spark there that makes him do creative work and put aside things he's not interested in. 
So it's something, but uh, I don't think it's much of a criterion. Of course, if somebody's score is very low in everything, you'd think, well, probably not qualified. Yeah. So it sounds like you're challenging this idea of, of general intelligence as being um, the, the most important or even important at all for college admissions. And um, what about life more broadly? You know, if you can find something, okay, I don't think it's a very interesting characteristic. What's interesting are, for the, you think, take a look at, I mean, we, I've had many years to look back, I'm sure you have too. Not as you many as back. you. Yeah, not as many. But when you look back and you ask, all of these kids who came in to MIT were very highly qualified. Uh, some of them had very distinguished careers, did a lot of exciting work. Uh, others just did routine uh, technical work, you know, perfectly competent, but uh, like it adds a brick, brick, a, a brick here and there to it, you know. If you look back, it's pretty hard to find the distinguishing characteristics. Actually, I was in the Society of Fellows at Harvard, uh, which is a very uh, highly selective uh, of three or four year research graduate fellowship, no, no duties or responsibilities. And they had a very, uh, they tried to have very high standards for selection, but would occasionally look back and try to do the same judgments and same story. You can't tell. These are really matters of character in many ways, yeah. more than technical, more than mental ability. I mean, you can have somebody who's a, you know, a math genius, but it'll never discover anything. It just doesn't have the right, right characteristics. Yeah, I really, I really appreciate that. Or you know, even creativity, we, you know, we find a distinction in our research between creativity and intelligence. You know, I'd like to talk about creativity a little bit because this is a topic that um, that you've talked about in in other, uh, you know, sort of even, even a political sort of way in terms of um, what societies can help us thrive and, and uh, mo are most likely and conducive to autonomy and human freedom and, and, and creativity. How do you define creativity? Like, how do you even conceptualize that, such a word? I wouldn't try to define it. The only terms you can really define are within well-grounded explanatory theories, so if you're working in physics, you can give a technical definition of energy within the framework. But if you were to ask me how I define energy in ordinary life, I can give you some descript description, but no, no definition. There aren't definitions outside of very narrow sectors of carefully constructed theoretical systems. But creativity, we, is the ability to, first of all, it's the ability to be puzzled by things. You have to start with that. There are, uh, infants have that capacity. They're puzzled by everything. They're constantly asking questions. They can't stop. It's annoying, you know. How does, what's this? How does that work? You know, if you're a parent, it drives you bananas. They want to. The world's very puzzling, strange. They want to understand it. Now that's driven out of people's heads in many ways, part by the educational system, uh, part in other ways. Uh, but there are some people who retain it. And in fact, if you look at the great moments of history of science, that's pretty much what they were. So take, say, the scientific revolution, 17th century, the great science that really change science radically. Uh, it basically was based on being puzzled. Galileo, his contemporaries were just dissatisfied with the what were called explanations of things. So why do balls fall to the ground? Well, it was an explanation. That's their natural place. They're attracted to the earth. They didn't regard that as an explanation. As soon as they began looking at it, they found that 
we don't really understand. And in fact, all that was believed turns out to be wrong. Like it was universally taken for granted that a heavy lead ball will fall faster than a small lead ball. Mm-hmm. Galileo showed by thought experiments, incidentally, never carried any experiments. By thought experiments, ingenious thought experiments showed this can't be the case. And uh, so that's what happens when you're puzzled. Now, pulling people are willing to question orthodoxy, not just to accept it, because that's what everybody says, but to be, to want a, an argument for it, to challenge it. Sometimes it's right, you get convinced. Sometimes you see it's just dogma. Uh, behaviorism was like that. Mm. It was just dogma. As soon as you began to look at it carefully, it totally fell apart. But it's hard to do that. There were people who did, like Lashley, for example, and who were ignored. But if enough people do it, they begin to interact, uh, they start to try to work out real answers. They keep finding flaws in their own answers, address those, and then you get creative work. But how to pick it out among people, you can't say. Or pick it up, but the other interesting question is how can we bring it out of people in a society? I really, you know, do you remember that, that conversation you have with Foucault? Does, it, does that ring a bell, that, that legendary conversation? You know... Uh, you, I remember it, of course. And yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm obviously you do. I'm joking, but it, it's a it's a very uh, well uh, watched video and, and and debate. But I'm just very interested in the discussion you had with him about about creativity. You two seem to have very differing views of uh, what the essential question there is for for how a society should be organized and and uh, and and issues of the role of justice for creativity. I was wondering if your thoughts about that have have changed over the years. I mean, as I understand Foucault's position, at least from what I got out of the discussion and reading his work, he doesn't seem to think, he he seems to think that everything just is a matter of who has more power than others. So it's a matter of distribution of power. And if you want to take a political position, say at that time he was a, pretty committed uh, sort of French style uh, uh, Marxist Maoist. So we're on the side of the proletariat and we want them to win. And if you ask, as I did ask, if you look back at the debate, suppose it turns out that the what the proletariat will institute is uh, uh, inhuman uh, destructive, cruel, and so on. Does that mean we oppose it? He said, no. It's just a matter of which side you're on. There's no right or wrong. There's no questions of justice. Uh, There's no basic human nature. Just which power system uh, takes takes control. That may be a caricature. I'm not sure. But that's what I understood his position to be. That's what I understood it as well. I, I totally reject that. I think there's a fundamental human nature. We don't understand much about it, but we can try to discover it. My uh, my guess, partly from experience, partly from study, partly from wish fulfillment, is that the goal of human beings is to be free and independent, a creative, uh, not controlled by others, under, uh, pursuing their own free and independent interests. This is the basic enlightenment position. It's what you find in Rousseau, uh, Humboldt, uh, other great figures of the enlightenment. And it's the origins of classical liberalism, which has long been forgotten. Uh, It's the reason, for example, why working people in the 19th century, early industrial revolution, were bitterly opposed to uh, a wage labor regarded it as a fundamental assault on human dignity and human rights. In fact, that was a very standard position at the time. It was, in fact, a slogan of the Republican Party that wage labor, wage labor, or what they called wage slavery, 
is no different from slavery, except that it's temporary, not to Abraham Lincoln. And in fact, that's the whole classical liberal tradition goes way back to the Greeks and the Romans. That's a modern idea that having a job is a good thing. But I think that the tradition is probably right, that people don't want to be subject to masters. And I don't care whether the masters are the central committee or the, uh, the uh, corporate, corporate sector. About the same thing. But that's a guess about human nature. Can't demonstrate it today. Yeah, it's a really good point. I'm trying to think a lot about the modern day, you know, uh, the social justice movements we're seeing today with Black Lives Matter. And there's, I don't know if you're familiar with the term woke or wokeness, and there some people criticize wokeness. And then uh, I'm trying to think, you know, do you ever hear anything from some of the arguments coming from what some would call woke, sort of denying a human nature? Um, and, 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 you know, because a lot of them really are big fans of Foucault. You know, do you ever do you have any criticize criticisms of maybe some of the um, methods used um, in modern day social justice movements that have moved us away from the classical liberal sort of ideal? Well, I think they don't understand the classical liberal ideal. Hmm. They regard the classical liberal ideal as modern capitalism. It's very far from that. They do, and even sometimes maybe viewed as um, modern day conservatism. You know. What modern day conservatism, in my view, is extreme authoritarianism. Mm. Well, libertarian in the United States is almost fascism. It's the most extreme form of subordination to power. It's just subordination to private power. Mm. And uh, that's even worse than subordination to the state. I mean, if you're like if you have a job in a factory, say, let alone an Amazon warehouse, uh, you're under, for most of your waking life, you're under the kind of control that Stalin couldn't have dreamt of. Like Stalin couldn't tell you that at three o'clock in the afternoon, you have uh, five minutes to go to the bathroom and uh, you got to wear these clothes and not some other clothes. And this is the path you have to take when you're moving from here to there. I mean, people, let alone an assembly line, which is kind of control that no dictator could even dream of, or a, a person working at a cash register, just totally turned totally into an automaton under total control of an authority. I mean, that's an extreme form of authoritarian control. Uh, we now, one of those dogmas that we don't question, kind of like behaviorism in 1950, is that this is a good thing. As I say, in the early Industrial Revolution, this was regarded as totally intolerable assault on basic human rights. Now it's considered the highest thing in life. I can get a job at flipping Hamburg, you know. It's a... Uh, I think that's uh, so. What you're saying about there's no oh, there's there are a lot of people like Foucault and many others who say there's no human nature. Yes, that's first of all it's insanity. That's like saying we're no different from cats. I mean, it's insane. You know, of course there's a human nature. What they mean is something different. They mean what they probably mean, which makes sense, is that the particular social forms and arrangements in which we are integrated are subject to change. Now, that's correct. That seems reasonable. But it's not going to turn us into, into insects. It's not going to give us a, an insect visual system. It's not going to get, turn us into creatures that are incapable of language. I mean, we have a nature, and in fact, it's very rigid and strict. Within it, there are variations, and social and cultural and other arrangements uh, uh, lead to variations. I mean, take, say, the visual system. Uh, since we 
just think of the classical experimental work, uh, Hugh Bill and Weasel, for example, on human on vision, mammalian vision. I mean, what they show is that early, very early uh, modification of the visual system, striate cortex, can lead to radical changes in the phenotype and the outcome that appears. I mean, it doesn't happen with us because we all have about the same visual experience. But if there was a mangala around who could stick electrodes into our uh, uh, visual cortex or control the stimuli that we see, we'd have totally different visual systems at the as uh, adults, maybe no visual system. Hmm. A cat, as they showed, if you uh, deprive a kitten of uh, structure, uh, visual stimuli for the first couple of weeks of life, it's essentially blind. The, the analytic systems just degenerate. Okay, that means, and it's kind of the same as speaking different languages. But the point is you can't change a mammalian visual system into an insect visual system with compound eyes. That's mammalian nature. Within mammalian nature, there's a lot of possible options. Within human nature, there's a lot of possible options. And it's the options that interest us as human beings. We take for granted what's common to us. It's kind of like sports. Like uh, when you go to the Olympics, you don't, you don't see a competition and walking across the room with anybody to do that. You see competitions and things that humans are no good at at all like pole vaulting. So if you go way to the edges of human competence, you'll start to find differences among people. But the overwhelming mass of competence is just shared. Well, I agree. I mean, this idea of uh, there being a common human nature and a shared common humanity, sometimes I feel like gets at odds with the massive... um, divisions we see today through identity, you know, political identities being the first and foremost thing that um, is the most important thing about a person these days, or um, or uh, um, or gender identity, you know. Uh, you know, the, the use of linguistics right now is um, very interesting in how we see a proliferation of gender pronouns, you know, f- uh, far beyond the, uh, the sex, uh, biological sex binary, you know. Uh, what what do you what do you uh, what are your thoughts on on this and and how we can um, balance the need to want to appreciate someone's personal identity and the things that divide us, but while at the same time not forgetting that there is a common humanity, there is a common human nature that that you're talking about. Well, first of all, let's let's try to take the standpoint of a uh, of an alien observer who looks at us the way we look at frogs, okay? Mm. Uh, That alien observer would say they're all identical. There are minor variations between them right around the extreme periphery. Just as if we look at frogs, we say uh, frog's a frog. But if you really started looking closely at different frogs, you'd find slight differences in the way they do things. Well, as a frog, you're interested in the differences. They don't care about the fact that we're all frogs. That you just take for granted. Yeah. You're interested in what's a little bit different between this frog and that frog. But from the point of view of us looking at frogs, it's so minor you can't even see it. And it's the same with this. Uh, what pronoun you use from the point of view of the nature of humans is so marginal you need a microscope to, to detect it. But for human life, that's what matters. We don't care. We don't even pay attention to the fact that we're all fundamentally humans. Uh, That we just take for granted. What's interesting to us in our lives is these very slight differences around the edges. Do you say uh, uh, everyone thought he was here? Or do you say everyone thought they were here or something? Uh, It's worth thinking about for human life, and it's important. So, for example, look, I wouldn't like it if uh, uh, people called me a kike, let's say. I mean, I don't think there should be a law against it, but I certainly wouldn't like it. I wouldn't like it either. 
Mm-hmm. I wouldn't like it either. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And it's the same. Share that. And if some woman feels she's being slighted, if you say he when you mean anybody, okay, I can understand that too. And you adjust to it. So you don't expect people to walk around talking about kikes and knickers and wops and so on. That's already internalized. Hmm. Pretty recently, incidentally, uh, you go back not very long, it was normal speech, even even writing. And one of my favorite articles from, uh, I think it's Forbes magazine, the, the main business journal, back in around 1930, was uh, 32, early 30s when I was a kid. Uh, it was a uh, it was Fortune magazine. Had a front page cover saying, the WAPs are unwapping themselves. Meaning Mussolini's doing a good job. Mm-hmm. So the WAPs are unwapping themselves. Wow. Uh, I don't think you'd say that now. No, I don't think so. So there's a, a positive, you know, this the, the use of linguistics to help us um, with an appreciation of differences and um, respecting uh, the uniqueness of an identity is uh, can be a positive thing in changing, uh, you know, in in inequality in a society. Is that what you're saying? Except that I would call it linguistics, just like. Uh... I wouldn't call it physics if I adjust the books on my desk so they don't fall. It's true, it's physics, but I don't have to go to a physicist to find out about it. I mean, and it's the same, same in this case. Linguistics isn't going to tell you anything about whether you should say the WAPs are unwapping themselves. Okay, it can describe it, but you know, give the rules for it. It's not going to tell you whether to do it or not. But just like a physicist isn't going to tell me how to adjust the books. Well, these are parts of human life which are way beyond the sciences of their comprehension. Uh, so, but yes, it's a, it's a topic you have to be concerned about. Uh, and I think you, know, you, have to, you have to ask yourself seriously, uh, should we uh, burn down the city of Washington because George Washington was a slave owner? Okay. I'm sure you can find some people who say we should. I, I don't think so. These are the judgments you have to make as a human being living in a complex society. So what do you think of the, um, the, the Black Lives Matter movement right now and, um, and, and, uh, and race being a topic of consciousness? Because I saw an interview you did about five years ago where you made a really good point about how uh, races and and slavery it's, it's a core part of human of uh, of our history as a, as a country Americans but it's not as big a part of our consciousness and now it's becoming you know and now it's really in our consciousness and I was wondering your some of your thoughts on that now five years later there's been a big change in the last few years among certain parts of the society not the society in general society in general is very racist shows up in all kinds of ways. A large part of the Trump vote, for example, is coming from deeply white supremacist circles, circles that don't feel themselves as racist. Like, I have black friends, you know, but just think the country is a white Christian country, and it has to stay that way. That kind of white supremacy is very widespread. And But on the other hand, there is a change in consciousness in many circles. You can see it in the reaction to the George Floyd uh, murder. Blacks have been murdered for a long time. This reaction was quite different. Mm. uh, Spontaneous, enormous in scale, way beyond anything in American history, and uh, widely supported at around 60% support. Uh, a lot of solidarity, uh, sensible goals. Uh, it was a very striking phenomenon, led by Black Lives Matter organizers, but many others coming in. Uh, well, that's one 
sign of serious changes. Want to see another sign? Take a look at this morning's New York Times. There's a very good op-ed by Eric Foner, fine historian, uh, calling for abolition. And what he's calling for is abolition of criminal labor, mostly black. Uh, he's, he's a historian of abolitionism, reconstruction, civil war, and so on. He points out that the 13th Amendment uh, banning slavery had a qualification that said forced labor is legitimate as a punishment. That, as he discusses, was the opening that the South used to institute slavery. And uh, he says, we still have it today in uh, private prisons where convicts are forced to work for uh, ridiculously low wages for profit. He says, we should really move on to abolition. He wouldn't have had that up a couple of years ago. It's a sign of the increasing consciousness and awareness of the really black history that is our actual dark, cr cruel history, savage history, that's part of our legacy. And we've never grown out of it, part of it. The extermination of the indigenous population is another part of it. Mm. Uh, and these are things that are gradually seeping into consciousness, not anywhere near enough. So there are Holocaust museums all over the country try to find out how many museums there are for slavery or yeah. nation of Indians. Yeah, I thought that was a good point. You, you made that point in that interview five years ago that you don't see, and I don't think we there, there has been many more slavery museums in the, that five years. So that, I thought that was a really good point. So mm -hmm. in, in some sense, we're making progress and social progress. And in lots of ways, you're, you're very pessimistic about uh, the future. You've called Trump, you know, our, our current president right now, the worst criminal in human history. That's that's a pretty big, that's a pretty big deal. Why yeah. more so than like Hitler? Did Hitler devote his energies to trying to destroy the possibility of human life on Earth? To try to maximize the use of fossil fuels and to eliminate the regulatory system that provides some mitigation is condemning the human species to extinction. Are we going to survive another couple of, if in the next few decades, if we don't deal with the elimination of fossil fuels, it's, we can be very confident that we'll have passed irreversible tipping points. Practically, 100% of climate scientists agree on this. I think it's a good point, but, you know, what I'm concerned about is, you know, Trump did win. There were a lot of people who didn't vote for him. Their primary, the people that vote for him, their primary concern, um, you know, a lot of them were poor. You know, they were concerned about their own lives. They're concerned about what they're going to do. And I think, uh, you know, I'd love to get your thoughts how we can get the Democrats to actually focus on reducing economic inequality in meaningful ways so they can bring on board and convince the poor and uneducated people to stop voting for, you know, the next Trump, you know, or even Trump four years from now. You know, what, what, can, what can we do as Democrats? Well, I think that's right, but we should separate it from the former question. Is Trump the most dangerous criminal in human history? I think that's worth considering. Mm. And I think the evidence for it is overwhelming. Every time I say it, I say, here's an outrageous statement, very outrageous statement. Ask yourself if it's true. Okay? And nobody wants to think about it. So we turn to something else. But I think it's pretty important. Okay, but let's put it aside. So what can the Democrats do? Well, that's a very pertinent question. In fact, we've just seen what happens when they don't do anything. So take the November election. There's been a lot of, there are areas of the country that voted for Trump that haven't voted for a Republican for 100 years. Mm -hmm. And there's been a good deal of discussion of it, like South Texas. 
Mexican-American area. It's an oil economy. Hadn't voted Republican since Harding. A lot of them voted for Trump. Even some counties went for him. The reason, what they heard from the their sources, Fox News, uh, the White House, uh, whatever they get their information from, what they heard is Biden wants to take away your job, destroy your community, uh, destroy your businesses, uh, devastate your families. Don't vote for him. Vote for Trump, who says, I'm going to keep your jobs, keep your families, uh, uh, keep the oil production working, and so on. That's what they heard. Now, if the Democrats were a political party that was had any concern for the general population, instead of being committed to Wall Street and rich donors and the wealthy professional classes, if that were the case, they'd have had organizers down in South Texas saying, look, it's a fact that we're going to have to get off the oil-based economy. There's just no debating that. That's like debating the weather. It's a fact. We have to face it. Now, here's the way we can face it. We can face it with feasible, sustainable measures, which will give you better jobs, better lives, better communities, happier existence. Here's the way to do it. But they didn't do that. No. Okay. So there's the answer to your question. You don't, you don't break through the propaganda. Yeah, that's what's going to happen. That's definitely one answer. Do you see any potential backlash from focusing too much, um, going too far left, and that kind of being the main democratic uh, talking points? You know, in terms of race and gender, uh, do you see any any potential problems with making that too much the central focus? You can. I um, mean, the atmosphere in many universities is by now toxic. Cancel culture? Are you referring to cancel culture? Well, it's called yeah. cancel yeah. culture, but it goes way beyond that. Yeah. It's uh, the disdain for people who uh, use the wrong pronoun, say. That's uh, a lot of young people in the universities feel they're walking on eggshells. Yeah. If I say the wrong thing or something that's slightly the wrong way then it's a tragedy You've gotta be you know i won't be killed but you have to be expelled from the society yeah and if you go that far you're doing completely the wrong thing totally so it's possible to take important issues and to destroy them okay, by just not handling them like what i said before somebody came along and said let's burn down washington uh, that's you know Maybe you can make an argument for it, but that's not the way to deal with the world, not a sensible way. What are your thoughts about defunding the police? Depend. Well, that's an interesting case. If you use, if you just use the slogan, defund the police, you're giving an enormous gift to the far right, hmm. and pick it up and run with it. They love it. They oh, say, yeah. these guys want to take the police out of your community so that Black criminals can come in and rob your house. Mm. You don't want that. Now, suppose you did it sanely, the way many of the organizers did, the way Bernie Sanders did, mm. the way uh, Alexandria Ocasio Cortez did. Now, she was asked, What do you mean by defund the police? And her answer was, Just go into any white suburb. That's what we mean by defund the police. Mm. If it can using drugs, you know, pick them up, uh, beat them up, uh, take them to jail and incarcerate them. You deal with it sensibly through community services. You have the police when you need them, but they're not supposed to be involved in community service operations, uh, family disputes, uh, overdoses, mental health issues. Those are not police issues. That's community service. I think the police are in favor of that kind of defunding. Uh, Bernie Sanders did the same. He said, yeah, that's what we want. We want police freed from obligations that are none of their business and are just a burden. And in fact, are probably 90% of what they do. Mm. Uh, and let's fund, let's 
have better pay for police, so it's a more uh, desirable profession, people are better trained, and have them focused on police work. But the things that should be done, like they're done in a white suburb, they should be done everywhere. Uh, I, I lived in a suburb of Boston. I'll just give you an example. The, uh, we were away for the summer, and some neighbors called us up and said, somebody broke windows in your house. So we came back to see what happened. Yeah, it turned out somebody had broken in. So we called the Lexington police, and they came over. And first thing they said is, look in your medicine cabinet. And we looked in our medicine cabinet, and yes, yeah, somebody had gone through it and taken some stuff out. And they said, this is kids in the neighborhood. We know who they are. We're not going to send them to jail. It's up to their parents and the community to discipline them and put them on the right path. That's the way to deal with it. I didn't want them to go to jail. I suppose it was a black community. You know what would happen. So when Ocasio-Cortez says defund the police means make it look like a white suburb, that's a message that makes sense. Yeah, and that goes that transcends the slogan, you know, this just just, just a, a superficial, you know, just to fund the police, you know, without any nuance or exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Well thank you for, for giving me your point on that. You know, I, I am wondering what's the biggest thing you were wrong about and changed your mind over in your career? A lot of things. Uh, I mean in in acad- in professional work, uh, scientific work all the time yeah right now i'm writing in the midst of an article which gets which just works on problems that i didn't notice in earlier things which are totally wrong and have to be fixed um that happens every day so in scientific work it's just that's what work is you find mistakes you correct them you move on in uh, social and political domains not very much I still believe pretty much when I believed as a young teenager. I mean, there are, indivi- there are individual things that are wrong, like uh, text day of the Vietnam War, which I devoted a lot of my life to. Yeah. I started in the early 60s when it was very unpopular, but yeah. that, was, that was much too late. Yeah. It started 10 years earlier, but nobody even heard of it. But by the early 60s, it was already getting out of control. There are things like that. Blah, blah. I have one final question. I want to be very respectful of your time. You have grandchildren, right? Great grandchildren. Great grandchildren. Okay. I can't see. One of them's in Japan. Oh. I can't travel. Can you see them on Skype or on the screen? Something like that. They don't know it's me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was just wondering if you could give advice to your great grandchildren, you know, for the life that they're going to grow up to, to live in 50 years from now, you know, when, when you probably won't be here, who knows, you may, you may be here, <laughs> but you know, what, what sort of advice for them? And then, you know, that can, that can just, uh, apply to, to any young person listening to you right now who really values and treasures your, your thoughts. Well, I never really gave, really gave any advice to my children. They didn't ask for it. Um, I didn't give it. I do get a lot of letters from young people these days asking for advice. And what I usually say is the only advice I know is if anybody tries to give you advice, put it aside. Mm-hmm. Figure out for yourself what kind of life you want and how to lead it. There's no general answers to how you should live. No rules. There's cliches. You can give the cliches, but it's really up to you. You have to create your own life. But if you're an activist, if you're an aspiring ac- academic, you want to make the world a better place, you know, surely you have some bit of, of advice you could pe- give to people hanging on your every word here. I can repeat the cliches. <laughs> they can figure them out for themselves. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, fair enough. Uh, just want to thank you so much for this chat, but also just inspiring me in my own career and uh, uh, and uh, being uh, such a legend. Good. Very, very pleased to talk to you.
Bye. Have a good one. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Psychology Podcast. If you'd like to react in some way to something you heard, I encourage you to join in the discussion at thepsychologypodcast.com or on our YouTube page, The Psychology Podcast. We also put up some videos of some episodes on our YouTube page as well, so you'll want to check that out. Thanks for being such a great supporter of the show, and tune in next time for more on the mind, brain, behavior, and creativity.